Uh, last week, uh, sadly, I lost a friend of my, my dad working in the mines due to TB. And he died just because of, uh, okay, he was treated uh, four years ago, then he thought it was over. But there was a, a lot of issues with the kind of diagnosis that he went through. And finally, he came to hospital and he's already severely sick and died uh, three, days, uh, three days later. So it is very painful to me to, to see such scenarios while there is capacity. We have tools, we have science, people are discovering a lot of fun stuff, but we need to put these fun discoveries into science for the people, science for the communities. So telling a person that you're going to be tested and it will take 60 days to have your results, then why should I do that? Test? So there's really still a need to, to build that capacity to ensure that especially the molecular technique, which is expensive in terms of cost, but I can say it is cost effective in terms of the value that it gives. The disease has killed so many elders. It's now finding its way to, to survive with us by affecting the largest number, uh, the largest of the population, and that is the young people. So it is very important that young people are considered fully as part of the community and, in, uh, and, and engage. So welcome friends. Today, uh, in another episode of NTB Dialogues, this is season two and 90 for 90 Global Voices series. Governments in 2015 committed to NTB and malaria and AIDS and viral hepatitis and several other goals and targets in 2015 when they adopted the Sustainable Development Goals. 90, over 90 months have passed by since then. Next month, the governments will meet to review. So, and almost uh, less than few 90 months are left. We are almost at the midpoint. But have HIV, TB, malaria rates halved? So if you look at malaria rates, for instance, they have definitely come down, but the decline is not satisfactory. And same goes for tuberculosis. Actually, TB deaths have increased. 1.3 million people sadly lost their life in 2015 to TB. But uh, in the, the, as for the last global TB report, 1.5 million almost people died of TB. Every case of TB, malaria is preventable if prevention is possible, you know, is made available and accessible to people. So let us hear, uh, you know, more from our guest today. He is a very special person. And also because he's, he's, he represents the youth community too, he's Alois Urasa. Welcome, Alois. Uh, thank you very much, Bobby, and uh, I really appreciate this invitation. Thank you. So Alois, friends, uh, as you, many of you may be knowing, he's from Tanzania. He's a public health scientist specializing in implementation and health systems research with a background in health laboratory sciences. He is currently the chair of the African Leaders Malaria Alliance Youth Advisory Council and a board member of Rotarians Against Malaria Global, as well as a Global Fund Advocates Network GFAN speaker. He previously served as a co-chair of the SADC Youth Forum, Climate Change and Environment Committee, and country coordinator for the Next Generation Global Health Security. What a proud moment, Alois, to have you amongst us. Welcome. Uh, thank, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So, Alois, let us dive deep uh, into, uh, you know, please tell us about is Tanzania uh, on track? And I will leave it up to you whether you want to refer to Tanzanian context or also expand it to African. But are we on track to end TB and malaria? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Bobby. And thanks again uh, for the warm introduction, but also for the invitation to participate in this uh, particular interview, which comes in a very critical moment where we are heading towards uh, uh, high level meetings that are going to happen in the coming month where the global community is going to be discussing uh, several matters uh, on, at a high level, including at uh, UN, United Nations high level meeting on TB, but also a high level meeting on uh, pandemic uh, prevention and preparedness, the, the PPPR, and many other discussions that are going to take place, including the SDG summit, that's gonna take place. But also this is coming ahead of uh, just one week ahead where by next week we are going to have uh, Africa Climate uh, Summit, which is also a very important uh, area for discussions on uh, the interaction of environment and health. As you know, when we come into the concept of One Health, that there's a huge interaction between human beings, environment, and uh, and the agents that cause uh, uh, diseases as well as animals. So coming uh, to the context of our discussion today, malaria, HIV, and TB, and with reference to malaria, for instance, 
uh, with, uh, with the recent statistics that we have that over 200, uh, uh, 200 million cases have been over the past decades have been reported globally, uh, malaria cases. And um, there's been a constant number of over 400,000 uh, 400, deaths each year occurring uh, with 2021 having uh, the 2020 during COVID having more deaths with a 12% increase in number of deaths where we had over 600,000 deaths uh, due to, to malaria alone. And all, uh, a large number of these, over 70% of it is children under the age of five and pregnant women. And when you look uh, at these diseases which are affecting children, then you'll see that it is a threat to our future. It is a threat to manpower. It, uh, it is a threat to sustainability, as we are discussing also sustainable development goals. Uh, coming uh, back to the context of Tanzania, uh, there has been, uh, uh, when, when we talk of whether we are on track or not, uh, starting with malaria, there has been um, uh, I can say, call it significant dec decline in terms of malaria prevalence, whereby in 2022, it was reported to be average uh, of 8.1%, uh, which is uh, a decline from 2015 when uh, there was uh, 14 point, uh, 14 point uh, prevalence uh, percentage. And then, but now looking at the risk, uh, for instance, in Tanzania, over over 90% of the population lives in uh, places with, with high malaria transmission or with malaria transmission, that's endemic places to malaria. So this is uh, a, a disease of concern to a country like Tanzania, which is endemic. And uh, given the current global statistics that 4.1% uh, of all deaths that occurred globally came from Tanzania, which is among the top four countries, which contributed highly to, to, the, uh, to the malaria burden uh, globally. Uh, looking at uh, at uh, tuberculosis TB in Tanzania, in 2021 there was uh, over 87,000 cases reported, and 86,000 these were uh, we call them new or relapsed cases, new and relapsed cases, and that is in terms of incidence, as uh, epidemiologists will call it, mm -hmm. and. And with this, it was that there was a 2.3 percentage increase in in TB cases in the country as compared to to the year 2020. And what is even more painful uh, or, or more alarming to us is that um, uh, for 16.2 percent of these new cases were of children under the age of 15 years of age. We can see how risky TB is in, in our country. I've not yet answered the question whether we are on track or not, but with this increase in uh, having children affected with, with, with TB, it's a threat and does not allow us to be relaxed and say that we are somewhere or we are, we, we are heading uh, somewhere because uh, in 20, uh, 2015, the percent out of all uh, TB cases, it was only it was ten percent. Let me not call it only because ten percent is still very big. Ten percent of it was children, but now there's been an increase of six point two percent. Where by twenty twenty one we had uh, sixteen point two percent of it being children. So this is a disease of risk of now. It is a risk of the past, risk of now, and it is highly risk for the future. Looking at the, 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 the incidences, uh, there has been a, a decline in terms of numbers when you talk of the statistics that the incidence of TB between 2015 and 2021 had a 32% reduction. And uh, in terms of death, there was a significant re reduction in terms of death. So whereby in 2015, there were 58,000 cases reported, while in 2021, we had 20, uh, about uh, uh, 25,800 cases are uh, deaths uh, uh, reported. And this puts that Tanzania as a country among the three uh, high uh, TB burdened countries to have uh, passed its uh, first milestone, one of the milestones in the NTB, NTB strategy, and makes it among the six um, high TB uh, but in the countries which has achieved the one of the targets on uh, the fight against TB, that is 35% uh, reduction in the deaths as of uh, 2015. So um, I'm, 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 I'm going around not to be able to answer uh, exactly whether we're on track or not, because well, for me, even if it's one person dying of a disease, then we are not yet there.
So until we are, we are seeing that zero coming, until when we are able to see more regions reporting less number and closer to zero uh, percentages of deaths uh, in, in terms of ATB, in terms of HIV, in terms of malaria, then I'll be able to say, yes, we are moving. But seeing all these uh, changes in terms of numbers, prevalence, this year coming high, this year coming low, tells a lot about uh, lack of sustainability. And another thing we'll talk about funding, for instance. Now, recently with all these uh, three uh, diseases, uh, HIV, TB, and malaria, over 90% of the funds comes from the donors. It sounds like a good statement to have uh, to, to receive um, a lot of support from, uh, from external source. But uh, it is a threat. It is a. It is. It is. Uh, when you look at in a, at another angle, you will see that uh, it is not something that we should cheer up for because we should be able to handle our own problems. And uh, with the current budgets that we have for health, uh, what is being allocated for health, it is still a problem. So unless we are able to allocate more than what we are seeking from outside, then I, I will say that we are on track. So, and this the picture of Tanzania tells about Africa at large. If you look at all sub-Saharan African countries, you'll find the numbers are more or less similar. So if you go to Nigeria, if you go to Uganda, if you go to all other countries, you'll find that the numbers are almost closely there. The burden is almost similar. The gaps are almost similar. Uh, challenges that are there, we have a lot of shared uh, challenges and opportunities in these countries in terms of funding, in terms of treatment capacity, in terms of diagnostic capacity, uh, in terms of follow-up and stuff. And maybe I'll talk, talk briefly about the, the treatment uh, for TB in with the context of Tanzania, for instance, where uh, the treatment strategies have identified and seen that the more you engage the community, the more you can identify more cases and the more you can enroll uh, more people into, into T TB pr uh, treatment. And uh, it has showed that out of all these detected cases, um, both the relapsed and new cases, over 90% of these cases have been, have been treated as per the report of um, uh, 2021 in Tanzania, which is the current uh, data that have, uh, I can find, find it public. Now, this 4%, it might sound, it's like a breakthrough, but 4% of people dying, it's a lot. When you, when you turn it into, into numbers and, to, and, and you count it as lives of people, then you'll see how, how still bad the situation is. So uh, the, there was unfavorable outcome out of this 4%, which is 3.3% of it. And uh, all these were deaths. When you say unfavorable outcomes in, in terms of treatment, then uh, it's mostly a death. And there was also loss to fall up. And I keep wondering why, why, why we acknowledge loss to fall up. This is among the things that we need to, we, we need to be at a stage where we can handle and uh, we, we can handle everyone, ensuring that everyone is comfortable, everyone feels received, everyone feels covered in the system or in the healthcare system so that we do not have to acknowledge and report uh, loss to fall up in terms of treating, uh, treating these cases. And there are also some cases which are more biological, which needs I can say needs more in a stronger intervention or innovations in terms of treatment failure. So there's some uh, a slight uh, percentage of uh, people uh, who are uh, who, who failed on the treatment of TB failed. And this brings us to a discussion on uh, on drug resistance. Uh, drug resistance. Although Tanzania is considered uh, a country with low um, mass drug resistance for TB, but still there is uh, about, about a consistency of 1.2% in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, resistance. And when you talk of 1.2, it might sound as a very small number, but this is large when you count in, you put it to the number of people. This is 442 people. So imagine having 442 people uh, taking drugs, but not being cured. This Imagine th th these people could have worked for two big companies. Imagine a company which can employ 200 people, 200 people, and produce. So you see uh, its impact in terms of economic uh, economic loss, its impact in terms of family upbringing, because these people are families. These people, uh, most of them are, uh, are adults. That means they are, they are, that people could be uh, relied on in their families. So the loss is more than just death. The loss is more than just people being sick. There is more and more and more and more loss in terms of that. Uh, thanks and back to you, Bobby.
thanks a lot alois for for you know for this kind of an overview and we totally agree with you like you know like there is zero excuse for not acting upon or uh, what we know works in tb prevention in malaria prevention in diagnosing tb and malaria in in you know treating and managing it uh, you have, you even one death is that is a death too many you know we always say tb is preventable it is not preventable for 10.6 million people worldwide who get tb in a single year or if or tb is curable tb is curable but 1.5 million people lose their lives because of tb in a year this is in worldwide so this is not acceptable absolutely you know we need to walk the talk so there's so much more which can be done can we go a bit deeper like uh, uh, for instance the who uh, the world health organization has endorsed and recommended that the first test which should be used for a person who has a presumptive tb who 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 may feel that uh, who wants to get a test for tb the first initial test should be a molecular test so that we can diagnose accurately so that we can diagnose early and so that we can also pick up rifampicin resistance this is possible we have the technology we have the tools but in uh, i come from india alois and in india only 23% of uh, patients uh, of people who uh, had presumptive tb they got a uh, molecular test last year this is not acceptable 77% had to go for sputa microscopy and sputa microscopy as you know is is less sensitive and we and is and its sensitivity even dips for the when we talk of children or or people living with hiv and and some other populations so so just just coming back you know we know how to diagnose tb we do molecular test we know the best of treatment one month treatment for latent tb four month treatment for drug sensitive tb six month treatment for drug uh, resistant tb this is more effective as well way more shorter way more way less toxic for 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 people so so um, so uh, let let us hear more on on what kind of tests are we using in tanzania and other african countries are we using the latest molecular tests uh, and are those are those tests point of care or decentralized Okay, Nathan, thank you very much, Bobby, for that question. And uh, it's a, it's a, when it comes to diagnosis, it's a very important approach when it comes to healthcare. Or if you're talking of universal health coverage and you do not have a, a stronger uh, diagnostic systems in place, then uh, there is no way you're going to achieve that universal health coverage. If you're talking of uh, achieving zero TB, zero malaria, zero HIV uh, infections, then there is no way we are going to achieve that if uh, there is no uh, sufficient diagnostic capacity. And that's why uh, continent, for instance, in Africa, we, uh, the, the, there has been, um, uh, it has been imperative to have systems like uh, the Africa CDC, where it is now a, a mono, uh, uh, it is now autonomous uh, to supervise, uh, to build capacity for other countries, but so to build that capacity in, at, at the continental level to ensure that there is more availability of this uh, testing, there is more availability in terms of workforce, infrastructure, and all the important uh, building blocks. And coming down to Tanzania and uh, looking at the capacity of testing or diagnostic services that are available for TB, uh, since uh, 1968, uh, with the support of British Medical Services or uh, those years, uh, just post-independence, uh, Tanzania was supposed to establish, the, to establish a central RTB and Lipros uh, reference laboratory as the CTRL. And this laboratory has been doing its work uh, for years and uh, with improvements, but still uh, there are gaps which are there. And currently the laboratory is SADCAS uh, accredited and uh, has, uh, it's established under the, it's working under the a program, a specific program for TB and Lipros, that is the national TB and Lipros program. Uh, just like for malaria, we are, where we have the national malaria uh, control program. The, the NMCP. So some of the tests that are being done there, it's always the common test. One is the the microscopy, whereby there, there is an deployment of fluorescent microscopy technique, and also there is a, a use of Zedian stain. Zedian stain is a technique where they're using um, a sort of chemicals to stain 
uh, they collect the sputum, then they put on this uh, on a slide, microscopy slide, and a microscopist goes to look at it to see if there is a presence of uh, what we call acid fast bacilli, and then those are the uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, which uh, uh, causes TB. So the problem with this technique, it's a good technique that can be very specific, but less sensitive, as you said, can be, uh, it's less sensitive, but it will work, uh, it works even uh, less better if there's a, a, a microscopist who is not uh, an expert enough to do the work or who has no enough experience to do the work. And most of this laboratory works need someone be, be able to, conf to confirm that, yes, what you saw was uh, was micro, uh, microbacterium tuberculosis. What you're writing, it is what you really saw. But now looking at the capacity of our health facilities, it is hard to find more than one microscopist in a lab. So uh, this makes the, 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 the tool not really reliable in terms of diagnostic, uh, diagnosing TB. Another technique that is being used by that lab and many other laboratories that are within, we have zonal referral laboratories, reference laboratories, including the one in the northern Tanzania where there's a Kibomoto hospital with a very, which has been dealing with TB cases for years since before independence. And another technique, as I was saying, is culture and the uh, microbiological culture, whereby they use different kind of media, as Lois Lenden's Jensen media, MGIT media, different kind of media that are being used. And uh, sorry for the audience that this might be a bit technical jargons, uh, but uh, the problem with these tools now, in terms of culture, whereby they grow the sample on a, on a media, it's like a disc or a, a dish where they grow the sample to see if the bacteria will grow after some days. The problem with this is in terms of time and also expertise again. We need experts who can do the work. We need resources which are well stored in terms of the capacity, but also to perform a TB, uh, these TB cultures and stuff, we need a laboratory that is well uh, structured, a level three laboratory with level three biosafety cabinet where it offers protection to both the sample, but also the person who is conducting that experiment. But now if you look at many laboratories, the capacity of doing that, they might have experts, but the facility uh, cannot support to do, it's not supportive enough to do the work. So those are still gaps that are, are within the system. And another issue with this, uh, the culture is number of days that it, it will take. So like the in the national uh, the national leaf reference the TB and lepros laboratory it takes up to sixty three days to confirm a culture result. So you can imagine you are sick and you have to keep taking some drugs that are just prescribed from somebody's looking and assuming that this should be TB for sixty three days. And I think this could be another reason which is taking us to resistances, resistance and uh, drug misuse and even leading to other problems to people, co co-infections, where someone is going to be treated for TB, but also in a few years, this person is suffering from liver diseases, from kidney diseases, because of the many drugs that have been accumulated to the body of this person. Um, leaving the amount of time, so it will take between 63, it's 49 to 63 days to uh, culture. But with... Uh, Another te technique uh, being used is the DST, where they're doing drug sustainability testing, because after you have seen that the bacteria has grown there, then this person is uh, having the TB infection, then there's a need to test the drugs. And this will take again other four days. So it makes it about 70 days just to say the person had to be, perhaps the person might have already died and that's when you are bringing res the results. So you can see the inconsistency of these uh, technology techniques. But the technique that now we have discussed that is of interest, that is the molecular technique, it is the most uh, highly sensitive, but also specific technique that can be used. And most of laboratories, especially the zonal laboratories have now, they now have the gene expert machines to, for, for, for TB. And this takes less days, maximum of two working days as a turning around time. So at least within two days, a person will be confirmed whether it's TB or not, so that to be enrolled to the treatment regimen. And if you look at number of people have been diagnosed, over 99 percent of them were enrolled to the uh, to, to treatment immediately after testing and this is also adding to to the capacity of uh, treating and fighting to be in the country but 
now this again takes us to a, another challenge of uh, having latent TB cases. And a study conducted in 2021 in Tanzania showed uh, where they used also molecular techniques to detect, which are not available in many, especially the, the low uh, resource settings, where you, you, you might just test, but you, you, people only go to hospital when they feel sick, but there are these people who have latent TB, whereby they will not feel sick until unless they are tested for TB. So there are cases of adolescents recruited to a, to, to a, to a study, and when they are tested, some of them, uh, of, uh, between 18 and 19% of them, out of many studies had latent TB infection and the study suggested and kept uh, uh, a recommendation that there's a need to raise awareness among adolescents also to check the health status but also the population of those living with HIV to test their status because having HIV it's also a risk to to getting TB because HIV lowers the immunity so if there is no this capacity of testing and ensuring that a person has tested positive for HIV or even negative for HIV has to be cancelled to go also to do a TB testing uh, but now the capacity is the problem or telling a person that you're going to be tested and it will take 60 days to have your results then why should I do that test? So there's really still a need to, to build that capacity to ensure that, especially the molecular technique, which is expensive in terms of cost, but I can say it is cost effective in terms of the value that it gives to, because we cannot weigh money and people's lives. So no matter how much it costs to, to perform a molecular diagnosis for TB, then it is it is uh, it's a moral obligation to ensure that uh, for the government and stakeholders to ensure that they avail enough resources to test effectively the people. Because if you are going to say you want a cost effective technique, you want something that is cheaper, then it is risk for the people, which is going even to cause more economic burden than how much you could have, uh, you could have, you could have spent to test and treat the people. So the government must see the importance of investing more into these molecular techniques that have proved beyond doubt that they are, they are better than any other technique that we are, the, the other conventional techniques that we have been using for diagnosing and uh, confirming TB cases. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree with you and glad to know that molecular tests are being used in Tanzania. In India, the most of the molecular tests which are used uh, uh, to detect uh, TB, like our 23% of presumptive TB uh, is diagnosed in India through uh, molecular test in 2022. That's a 2022 data of the government. So, uh, so all of all the people who get molecular test, they get a point of care and decentralized battery operated molecular test uh, called TrueNet. So uh, I've heard that it's also being rolled out in Tanzania. So, so is am I right, or have you heard about it? And it because it's point of care battery operated decentralized so perhaps it makes much more sense so you have, you're very right if we need to diagnose so we the, if the pay, person is unable to come then the, the test should reach the people especially in uh, in low resource setting and i'm most uh, before you answer my question i about uh, trunet and and if you have point of care and on uh, decentralized uh, molecular testing in tanzania uh, let let me uh, also re reinforce what you just said about economic impact of tuberculosis and malaria like every it is not about you know it is it's not about health spending it's health investment it's a smart investment but ap apart from that whether it is a, first of all most uh, you know uh, the, the thing which should take primacy is what alois has just said it's a human rights imperative to provide best of diagnostics and treatment and care and support for every person who has tb and malaria and to prevent the chain, break the chain of transmission of the infection as well, of course, uh, in, in, when it comes to TB. So, uh, so uh, uh, Alois, you might have read a very recent report just came out this early this week. Says uh, again, he says that one dollar of in, uh, t, uh, invested in TB will yield forty six dollars later on. And I, this reminded me of a World Bank report, which came up, I think, in 2007 or 8, which said that uh, $1 invested will yield $9 in some countries and $15 in very high burden countries. So imagine, you know, there is, of course, there is a human right imperative. There is a economic sense as well in investing in TB and malaria. And let us hope that happens. So uh, now I should, you know, close my mouth and let us hear from you about the rollout, uh, if it is happening about uh, 
you know, point of care, decentralized, battery operated, easy to use kind of molecular tests, which can, uh, which can be, you know, used in, in the settings and difficult to reach pe people to. Over to you, Alois. Uh, th thank you very much, Bobby. Um, I don't, I, ha I don't ha have enough uh, sufficient information to answer that. I think I need to do a closer follow-up to see if that is being deployed uh, in the in the semi settings, but also in the lower uh, level settings. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks, Alois. Please let let me know over email or WhatsApp or, or you know uh, later on if you find more information. Also, because you know this uh, the TrueNet which we have in India can also is a multi disease platform. So it can also test uh, like uh, the machines which were de uh, deployed by government of India for COVID-19. They are also being used in TB program. Uh, one of the government program officers in Kangara in Hamachal Pradesh told me earlier this month. So uh, similarly, they, um, they, they also test HIV, malaria, uh, and hepatitis, um, HPV, and it's about 40 or 30 or 40 more uh, such infections. So we will look forward to hearing more from you later on post the session, and we will post an update if there is any uh, in the description. So before we close, we know we have taken um, a lot of your time, Alois. You must have so much to do. And uh, all the best for the meeting, which is coming up next month. But before you go, please let us know, please just share what needs to happen in the next 90 months to diagnose TB as soon as possible, earliest, accurately, to put people through the treatment and cure with the best of things. And so that, uh, and of course, break the chain of transmission of TB infection. And of course, and also in malaria. It is okay, yeah, thank, thank you very much, uh, Bobby, and for that description as well. Uh, looking at the next 90 days and looking back at what has been done within the last 90 months, sorry, not days, months, uh, about seven and a half years, uh, since the promises that have been made in terms of uh, ending HIV, TB, and malaria by 2030. I'm worried to say anything about uh, whether we'll be meeting the targets by 2030 because uh, there are targets uh, that were, were made for 2023 and, for instance, in terms of malaria, whereby the Commonwealth uh, said having malaria by 2023, and then there's zero malaria 2030 and 90% reduction of different diseases by 20, 2030 and achievement of the sustainable development goals, which have several targets on key diseases, including malaria, HIV, and TB. Uh, looking at the, if you assess at every level and see the progress that has made, uh, we can define it as a significant progress, but still it's not a satisfying progress because still people are dying, still people are being infected and don't know what to do, where to go. Still, there's a, a problem with affordability. Uh, there's still a lot of inequitable, inequitable distribution of resources. Who gets what, mm -hmm. who can do what, who can speak what, who can earn, who can take what kind of drug, what kind of drugs should be taken to this country and to this country in terms of their efficacy. Mm -hmm. uh, vaccines deployment, how much, uh, what quantities should be taken to this country? What quantities should be taken to, to, the, to this country? We look at recent uh, with, the, with the distribution of, uh, let's say, a malaria vaccine for the uh, under, uh, under ch uh, children under the age of five, whereby there was a framework that was set to identify countries to which should be beneficiaries of this vaccine. I understand that it's due to uh, resources that are available, but uh, I think uh, to in the next 90 months that have remained, we must understand that uh, a person is a person, whether that person lives in Africa, whether that person lives in Asia, that person lives in America, lives in Europe, a person is a human being. And uh, our, our life, um, the life, uh, right to life is equal for everyone. So there's no need to decide or to, to set a framework who should get what, because what works better, uh, everybody deserves to do it. We must build, instead of uh, setting and complaining that we have low resources for diagnosing, treating, and preventing these diseases, then we have to struggle to ensure that we increase those resources. Because uh, for me, I, I, I don't believe that the world does not have capacity to to, to, to supply enough for TB detection. I don't believe that the world does, does not enough capacity to, to treat, uh, to diagnose and treat all malaria cases and even uh, HIV. So it's just a case of uh, willingness and a case of uh, intention, being intentional. So it is my call for the global community to be intentional enough 
to be uh, to, to 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 increase the the political will, to increase even the scientific will that we are going to develop these tools. We are going to innovate enough. We are going to integrate the tools that we have. We are going to modify and strengthen the tools that we have so that we are going to end these diseases. So it is a matter of commitment. It is it's a matter of intention. So the we need to be intentional enough. And another thing that we need to do is increase the financial resources. And then again, this takes back to intention. There's a lot that is happening in the world, a lot of businesses that are happening. People need to deploy people and uh, most of these resources that we need in terms of the business, the global business, are coming from the low resource areas where TB infections are high. Uh, last week, uh, sadly, I lost a friend of my, my dad working in the mines due to TB and uh, this person had de developed tuberculoma uh, that is the highest stage of the TB. And he died just because of, uh, okay, he was treated uh, four years ago, then he thought it was over, but there was, I, I don't know, I cannot comment enough, but there was a, a lot of issues with the kind of diagnosis that he went through. And finally, he came to hospital and he's already severely sick and he never thought it is TB again because he was earlier treated until when he was lately diagnosed with tuberculoma and died uh, three, days, uh, three days later. So it is very painful to me to, to see such scenarios while there is capacity. We have tools, we have science, people are discovering a lot of fun stuff, but we need to put these fun discoveries into science for the people, science for the communities. And also what we have, we, we failed many years ago is uh, if you look at literature as how science was being done, is the separation of science and the people, science and the community. We must do science for the people. There must be a responsible way of conducting science and, and, uh, and especially health sciences must be conducted by involving the people, working with the people because they know better, they know a lot, they know why they cannot do this, why, why they're not doing this, why they're suffering, why are they suffering from this? They know a lot. So that's very important for the next 90 days to ensure that there's effective uh, mechanisms to engage the community effectively. And when I talk of the community, I'd like to reiterate this whenever I speak. Young people are the community. Young people are in innovative enough to do this work. They, it is a must, it is imperative that young people are given space to think about these problems because as you saw, uh, if you read through the literature, you'll see that the burden of diseases is just shifting because the, the disease has killed so many elders. It's now finding its way to, to survive with us by affecting the largest number, uh, the largest of the population, and that is the young people. So it is very important that young people are considered fully as part of the community and, in, uh, and, and engaged. But again, coming to this uh, world of innovations and coming up with new techniques, it is important that the science community works together to integrate these approaches so that they are more powerful approaches. Yeah, that, 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 is, that could be my great call for the coming 90 days, but also investments are crucial. We cannot innovate, we cannot engage the community, we cannot improve uh, research and development uh, platforms if there's no financial resources on the table. So increase the, the resources, uh, ensure that there is both this multilateral and uh, bilateral uh, funding uh, uh, funding platforms are fully capacitated to do the work, but also the both multilateral and bilateral platforms have to ensure that there's enough integrity, fairness, and social justice and equity in terms of distributing these resources and but also monitoring and evaluation of these resources. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alois, again. And uh, totally echo, the, you know, like social justice and equity should be the underlying principles. I also totally, uh, you know, uh, echo all the, all the recommendations which you have just said. And let us hope uh, governments walk the talk on that. And especially on using the tools uh, which we already have. There is no excuse to use outdated 140 years old tools when th there are s a s much better tools which, which can reach the people who are less served or underserved or unserved. And, and totally the, you, the hope lies in the young people, definitely. And we really hope that uh, more leaders, more young leaders, uh, you know, um, uh, join your force, which already are. You uh, friends uh, who have joined us late, we were listening to Alois Rasa, who is currently the chair of uh, African Leaders Malaria Alliance Youth Advisory Council, a board member of Rotarians Against Malaria Global, 
and a global fund advocate network GFAN speaker. So, so thanks a lot, Alois, and it was really uh, insightful to hear from hear your words. And we really hope uh, that uh, you know your power can make a difference next month when heads of the governments meet at the UN high level meeting on TB as well as the SDG summit, which is happening on 18th September, if I remember correctly, and other important meetings, which are, which will be there as well, uh, including pandemic preparedness. So all the best to you, all the power. Thanks a lot for joining us, Alois. Bye-bye.